Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second lecture in Beyond Bitcoin. Today's lecture is by far the most technical one. So please don't be scared. Please don't be worried. Nicholas Kavita and I are here to answer any questions. Um, you can either add them to the chat in Zoom or to the Slack channel. That way, if you add them to the Slack, even if we don't get to them during Nicholas's lecture, then later on, we'll be able to answer all of them and also provide extra material. So we're here to help. Nicholas, are you all set? Okay, great. So um, before we begin, uh, uh, some very quick administrative uh, announcements for today. Um, this year, just like last year, our class is oversubscribed. Um, but the good thing is that since this year, the lectures are happening through video, we were able to invite uh, auditors. So uh, today, as of today, uh, auditors of the class are also participating through Zoom. That's why you guys uh, see a lot more people in the room today uh, compared to last uh, time. This and potentially next would be the two most technical classes we'll have in the class. It was is uh, the lecture was originally created for a uh, computer science class that I designed, uh, but don't worry, it was heavily adapted to uh, get simplified and sometimes oversimplified to require zero background knowledge. Uh, the reason why we wanted to have these two lectures anyways, even if uh, they uh, may seem a little too technical for non-CS uh, 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 or technical uh, student, is because uh, there's a lot of uh, aura behind uh, Bitcoin and uh, that uh, makes it sound uh, more complex than it actually is. It's actually con conceptually pretty simple and uh, all these uh, obscure puzzles that need to be solved, all these, all these weird uh, sometimes sounding concepts are actually very straightforward if we tell you exactly what, what they are. Having said this, I want to give you the agenda for today and, uh, and next class. We'll be talking about the following uh five topics and potentially some advanced topics if we have time at the end so the topics are the following cryptographic hashes which is a very important cornerstone of what's needed uh, a building block of uh, of blockchains they, they are possible because of these we're going to be talking about what what is a block what what then becomes a blockchain then we will talk about how bitcoin puts these uh, concepts together and, uh, and then, most likely in the next lecture, uh, we are going to talk about the security of blockchain and the security of Bitcoin. Why can we have anonymous uh, um, miners or nodes, as they are otherwise called, um, being uh, those people who are uh, uh, processing our transactions and we still trust them? That is all possible because of those cryptographic uh, uh, properties that uh, uh, Bitcoin and blockchain is, uh, is utilizing. So, so we, we, without further delay, let's start with uh, the simplest of the concepts, um, hashes. So um, a hashing function is a function, just like in math, it's a function that gets as an input an arbitrary length of data. It can be a text file, it can be a block in a blockchain. And as an output, it produces a digest of those data into a specific size. What do I mean by digest? Uh, it's something, it's a, let's say, a string looking uh, thing that always has exactly the same size. So no matter how big the data is, the data could be one byte. The, the, the hash of that data is still the same size. The data could be an entire video file that is giant. The hash is still uh, the same size. So the function gets data and produces hash of those data. And an important property of this is that the same data will always result to the same hash. And uh, one very popular uh, such a hash function, especially used by Bitcoin, is, is, is called SHA-256. It's 256 because the, the resulting hash has 256 bits, which if you translate it into hexadecimal digits, then you get 64 hexadecimal digits. That's why... Um, uh, that's how it looks. And uh, let me show you this with a specific example. So if I click on this, it will open this uh, software, which is open source software that uh, I adapted uh, slightly for the uh, purposes of today's lecture. 
so that it can uh, uh, con um, emphasize the points that I, I wanted to make. And I will point a link uh, to the source code. Um, I did not write the software, just modified. So here's, uh, it's, but I like it because it's very visual. So here's an example. The, uh, if I put as data the letter A, then I'm getting a has, this has down here. If I change this, then the has changes significantly. The entire has is completely different. Even though my input is only by one, by one character different, I didn't see one character change in the has. I saw the has completely changed. And let's go back to A to see to see that the hash is still the same. You see, the hash of A is five five nine, and going back to A again five five nine. No matter what I do, and the data, uh, as I said, could be uh, uh, arbitrary length. There, okay, it can be it can be very long, and the hash is still the same size. Okay, now. There is the concept that certain hashes are very secure. And that would be the content of the next lecture uh, where I will explain to you why, what, why this is important and uh, how secure are they. Um, but this property is making the blockchain essentially possible. But uh, let's not uh, jump to it just yet. Now, let's talk about blocks. Um, to talk about blocks, I'll start talking a little bit about finance and ledgers. And uh, so uh, let's introduce ledgers. So as you know from your finance classes, a ledger is essentially a spreadsheet of financial transactions. And why we are talking about ledgers is, is the fundamental um, uh, facility of a blockchain is essentially a ledger, a decentralized ledger. So that's why we're talking about ledgers and explaining ledgers right now. So this a ledger could look like this. It's a list of financial transactions. At 5 p.m., Alice gave to Bob $1. At 5.01, Bob gave to Carol half a dollar, and so on and so forth. They are transactions, and they have uh, um, a timestamp. All right. So now, for arbitrary reason, without uh, explaining why, I am saying instead of let, let's have a lower low uh, less qu lower quality ledger here and rather than storing the exact time of every single transaction when it happened let's just uh, say we are going to be storing transactions every 10 minutes and therefore we're going to be okay that we lose this information of when each transaction really happened all right so if we're storing uh, storing at 510 let me go back um, we were, we're going at 510 we have knowledge of these three transactions so we can just, just store them as 510 as if all of them happened a few minutes later and the same at 520 we have this transaction 530 we have this transaction then it becomes like this okay let's take uh, now this concept one step further and let's say that uh, because all these transactions here at 510 the all of them happened at 510. I don't need to store 510 on each one of them. And I'm just going to say that all of this happened at 510. And all of this happened at 520. All of this happened at 530. So I am keep uh, creating the concept uh, in, a, in computer science terms. So for an arbitrary reason, I just split my transactions into different records. And I call the first one record one, the second record two, the second record three. Rather than storing them in one big spreadsheet, uh, each record, let's say it's a different spreadsheet. And every 10 minutes, I have a new spreadsheet. Uh, now, because I want to keep track of uh, what, is, what is the order of the spreadsheets, um, I can store this information that tells me, that gives me a link, like a URL of the, if it's a Google spreadsheet, it gives me the URL of the previous spreadsheet. So I store the URL of the previous spreadsheet, and that's how, if I'm on this spreadsheet, that's how I can I can uh, uh, how I can find all the previous spreadsheets by following these uh, pointers. And obviously, there will be a, a Genesis record that will have no previous uh, um, uh, record to it. It will be the first one. Okay. So now let's try to abstract the concept a little further. And let's call all of this stuff 
uh, let's just call it data because I'm trying to come to produce to show you what the block is and to simplify I will just call all of that uh, stuff data and then a blockchain block what it really is it's more things but what it really is is that data that I was talking about it's something we call a nonce and the hash of the concatenation of the data with the nonce these three things now what is a nonce nonce is uh, just uh, an arbitrary integer number that uh, i can change however i want and it doesn't really change my whatever transactions are stored in this uh, in this block because the transactions are in data and nonce is completely independent but it's very important because the reason I have it is that when I change the nonce, even though the data are the staying the same, the transactions that we had uh, between people stay the same, the nonce changed, therefore the hash of this block changed. So now Bitcoin or Satoshi came up with this uh, arbitrary definition that says that a valid block is a block for which the hash starts with many zeros. And we'll look at that uh, in a minute in the example. But, um, but hashes usually don't start with many zeros. Hashes are, as I showed you earlier, they look very random. So it's very hard to produce a hash that has starts with many zeros because it's unlikely that the hash is so, um, so repetitive. Uh, so and then mining is the process of changing nonces con constantly until you find a nonce that makes that new block that you're trying to mine valid. So let's look at this concept right here. All right. Same software, a uh, little uh, advanced version of what we see. Um, this is what I call the block. Maybe it has a number. So that's the first block. It's the Genesis block. So uh, it's number one. Then uh, this is the nonce. And here I have my data. My data could be that Alice sends to Bob uh, three Bitcoin. Okay. So, and the hash is data concatenated with nonce and in this case concatenated with a block number uh, as well and this is the hash now is this a valid block no because it doesn't start with many zeros so what do i do i go here and change my nonce zero mm, no one mm, doesn't start with many zeros two uh no three uh nope Okay, so what this software here does is it has a button that uh, calls a JavaScript function on this page that uh, uh, is going to run all the numbers from zero until it finds a number that makes this has to have many zeros. Let's, let's press it and see what happens. All right, the background changed to green and your hash here is starting with four zeros. Four is arbitrary. In this specific case, we just said that we we, can, we define a valid block to have at least four zeros because if you had more than four, it would take forever to uh, compute it. And for demonstration purposes, we choose we chose four. All right. So here's what the software found: that if you have typed the number 14, 11, 16, the hash of the whole thing would have been starting with four zeros, and this nonce makes this block valid. So uh, if I was doing it manually, I, it would have taken us forever, but thankfully the software did it uh, uh, faster than us. So uh, in this case, imagine that when I was in the 14, 11, uh, 14, 115, it would have been not what we want. And then we, when we tried the 16, all of a sudden the hash starts with many zeros, and then we are very uh, happy we mined the block. This is a valid block. Okay, uh, now let's look at uh, the next concept. The next concept is blockchains. So I want to add um, the, the concept of uh, every block 
contains all the nonces and everything else that I said. But what I'm talking about in this specific slide is that it contains a pointer. It's not anymore a URL that I told you one spreadsheet is pointing to the URL of another spreadsheet, but it is um, the hash of the previous block. So this value right here is, a, is the exact same value as the value right here. So this way you chain the blocks together. So let's look at that as well. Um, okay, so here's how the blockchain uh, um, would look. Um, we, are, we keep in improving our block so that it can have all these concepts that I'm talking about. Uh, the first block, the Genesis block, uh, has no previous uh, hash. So let's just put it all to zeros. And it has data such as A gives to B three Bitcoin. Now, when, uh, when you do that, you have to mine. You see our hash is not all zeros anymore. Let's just mine this. And uh, as you see, the software here helps me by moving this hash from here to here. And uh, now if in the next block you say B gives to C 0 0.5 Bitcoin, and then we, we mine this block. We will end up with a valid block that has multiple zeros here. And um, if we continue doing that and say C gives to A 0 0.2, we'll mine this block as well. Uh, now I want to give you a, th the first interesting property of the blockchain and why it makes things uh, 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 pretty secure uh, and uh, what we call immutable. Um, what would happen if uh, actually B comes back and says, oh, you know what? You didn't give me back then three Bitcoin, you gave me four. If I change this to four, anything I change in this block it's going to destroy this hash. And then it's going to destroy this hash and it's going to destroy this hash. So, so it's extremely easy to detect even a single, chain, a single change in the entire chain of the blocks. So when you, so the only thing you need to look uh, when, if you wanna know if a blockchain is, uh, is valid, uh, you just need to look at the latest block because that latest block contains a hash of the previous of the previous of the previous. A quick question about what, what you, maybe you're about to do this, uh -huh. uh, but uh, the example you gave where you changed the data. Now, presumably, if you mined that new data in that example, mm -hmm. you could come up with a hash that would have start with the zeros, but then that hash would not be uh, would be different than than the one the pointer in the next block, uh, which kind of breaks your chain uh, and is detectable, presumably. And that's that's how you prevent. Um, that's how you. That's how you uh, retain the integrity of the chain. Now, is it uh, is it the case that uh, it's po it, theoretically it would be possible to create the same hash with the new data and a different nonce? So, is the is the uh, issue that it's so it's so computationally difficult to do that that it it's it it can't happen basically. It is possible that you can have collisions. This is the next class, uh, but it is highly unlikely. It, it will take, uh, a, we, uh, let me put it uh, um, like simply. No one has ever found a collision on uh, SA-256. And if you, have, if you find one, not a specific transaction, A to B sends three and change it to something else, but any collision, we know they exist theoretically, but no one has ever found even a single um, uh, collision like that. This is called a collision. So if you find one, you will be uh, very famous and uh, you, you, things will need to change in the world because we will need to find uh, to improve our uh, cryptographic uh, uh, functions that we use. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next let's look at uh, Bitcoin. A little more uh, in, uh, uh, in detail. So, uh, how many zeros do we require uh, the blocks to have? Well, 
the more zeros, obviously, the more difficult for computers is to find uh, the right uh, norms to produce that, um, um, that, that kind of hash. And what Bitcoin does in its code, it basically adjusts dynamically this uh, difficulty um, so that one block is produced every about 10 minutes. So uh, what it does is that um, every two weeks, the Bitcoin uh, algorithm uh, uh, between producing the next block is running a computation, which essentially looks at how many blocks have been, uh, uh, how much time has passed for, for producing the last uh, 2016 blocks. And 2016 times 10 minutes is about two weeks. And if it finds that the amount of time that it took for these 2016 blocks to be produced is less than two weeks, it means that the difficulty was not difficult enough and it increases the difficulty. And if it finds that uh, the the, it was more than two weeks, it means that, uh, that we, we didn't have enough hashing power in the, um, in the, on, on the, in the world uh, and it needs to reduce the difficulty. So the difficulty is essentially this number D here that you have to divide the, the, the hash so that you can say that uh, a hash must be lower than the maximum hash divided by this difficulty. What I'm, what I'm really trying to say here is that um, if a number, if a hash starts with a lot of zeros, then that hash is smaller than, uh, in this case, uh, let's say, um, uh, one here and everything else uh, uh, zeros. So that's what uh, it means. Is that uh, do you, is that um, is there a question here about what difficulty means? It essentially tells you how many zeros are required, uh, and that's why it is defined as two to the power of two fifty six, because there's two hundred fifty six digits in a in a hash, bits in a hash. So two to the power of 256 is the maximum hash you can have. And if you divide that by difficulty, then you basically keep adding zeros uh, uh, here in the beginning. And uh, I, for, for reference, uh, today the difficulty is uh, roughly 20 uh, times 10 to the power of uh, 12, which means it's, it's the number 20 trillion. And uh, the, the resulting block, including the nonce, especially the nonce and the hash of the block is what people call proof of work because this proves this very hard work that the whole world did to eventually one of them randomly find such a nonce. And once you have the nonce, then you can very easily uh, check that the nonce uh, indeed um, satisfies this condition. So let's look at one more con con concept here. Uh, the concept of Coinbase. What is Coinbase? Well, we all know it's a popular uh, crypto exchange uh, in the US. Uh, no, 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 actually Coinbase is a very specific uh, field that exists inside every Bitcoin block. And that's why that's where other concepts got their name from. Uh, and what this, this is, is essentially each block contains transactions from person A to person B, person A to person B to person C, and so on and so forth. But there's one very special transaction on every block, which is nobody, Bitcoin itself, the algorithm, no one, gives money to somebody. And who is that somebody? Well, that somebody is always, it can be whatever you want, but uh, people always put themselves. So whichever node or whichever miner or whichever peer, however you want to call them, was able to uh, find the right nonce for this block, obviously he had put their own Bitcoin address in the, in the Coinbase so that they get that amount of newly minted Bitcoin. And uh, in the beginning, the Coinbase was 50 Bitcoin per, per 10 minutes, basically 50 Bitcoin. And it halves every 210,000 blocks, which is roughly every, every four years. So um, it, it has halved three times so far. And currently the Coinbase is 6.25 Bitcoin. Here, I have um, the concept of uh, multiple um, 
nodes. They're called uh, nodes, peers, or miners. Uh, all these are, uh, words are um, describing the same thing. So there is the Alice, the Bob, and the Charlie. Uh, each one of them uh, has the coin base. Each block, as I said, has the coin base and the list of transactions. Here's we can see some transactions. So um, 10 Bitcoin, I've made it a little too big. Let me make the page a little smaller so that it can be more visible. Um, so in this case, uh, 10 Bitcoin are uh, sent from this person to this person and so on and so forth. Um, and But what's interesting is that every node is trying to set the coin base to themselves. So Alice is sending it to Alice and Bob is sending it to Bob and Charlie to Charlie and so on and so forth. So what happens is that when all of them are mining at the same time, they all press this mine button at the same time to mine block one. But uh, let's say Alice found the right nonce for her block first. If you see, if uh, Bob tries to find this, the nonce will be different for Bob. It's 15,310, whereas for Alice it's 6,768. Why is it different? It's different because the blocks are not identical. Alice is trying to mine a block that gives the coin base to Alice. And Bob is trying to uh, mine a block that is giving the coin base to Bob. So what happens in practice is that when um, all miners are mining a specific block and whoever finds the no a nonce that satisfies the, the, their block first, publicizes this nonce, it's basically sending it to everyone together with the block and all the data of the block that they mined. And then everybody else uh, makes sure that what the claim is correct. And it's very easy because, because you already have the nonce and you just need to say here, Alice. And then uh, Bob checks and sees that Alice says the truth, that this is a block that is valid. And then uh, what happens is that uh, every node applies this to their current copy of the blockchain. And every, every node makes the decision that, ah, uh, we are done now with block one. Let's all start mining block two, block three, block four, and so on and so forth. And then uh, what happens with block two is a similar process. Um, you uh, get, uh, everyone is trying to mine for themselves and uh, whoever finds it first, let's say in this case, Bob found it, uh, found the nonce for this block. And then Bob uh, um, announces this to, to the world and everybody tries it and update the data with what Bob said. And, uh, and voila, everyone says that this is valid. And then they all move to the next block. And remember, the, the difficulty of Bitcoin, how many zeros we need to have here, is so high that it takes the whole world computing concurrently, like trying different nonces, for just one node to find a nonce that, that is valid every 10 minutes. So it's not like something like here that uh, finishes in a few seconds. It's something that uh, takes 10 minutes. So at the end of the block, when the block is announced, everybody, and I will explain in the next lecture why an additional reason for that, but everybody has an incentive to consider this block done and move on and start uh, uh, mining the next block so that maybe hopefully the next block is the one that they're going to win rather than them keep mining an old uh, block that everybody, the whole world moved to, an, to, to the future of the blockchain and they're still mining the old one. They immediately abandon that block and move to the next, consider it uh, uh, done. Now, another concept that I want to say here is what, uh, 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 someone who asked a question earlier uh, mentioned is that uh, obviously the blocks are not having just data, they have uh, tra structured uh, transactions. And there's more, more, more information that is missing uh, here from the uh, transactions that I will explain in the next uh, uh, class, the cryptographic uh, signatures uh, specifically. Um, so what else do we see here? What we see is that at the Genesis block, we did not have any transactions. And the reason is because no one had Bitcoin yet. So no one has Bitcoin, no one can transact, transact with it. So what happened is that the Coinbase comes here and gives to Alice 
for Satoshi in our uh, real world example, uh, 50 Bitcoin, so that then that Satoshi person can give it to others and then the whole economy can, can be ignited and, uh, and take place. Um, let's look at the real Bitcoin block from earlier this morning. Um, interesting concept. I told you miners sometimes are unknown. How can we trust them? We'll talk about it next class. This is the current difficulty. This is the exact number. That's what I said. It's 20 trillion. This is the nonce of that block. It's what's that 1.5 billion uh, something. Uh, and this is the block reward. Uh, this is the Coinbase 6.25 Bitcoin. And there is also tips that uh, people give uh, uh, in order for their transactions to be included in the block. So if uh, you have more transactions, each block can uh, have a certain number of uh, transactions in it. And if there are more transactions in the network that need to be executed than the ones that uh, can fit in a block, then what uh, end ends up happening is that essentially uh, people who want their transactions to be included in the next block, they including a, a blank check pretty much that essentially uh, the miner can, can cash out to themselves and, uh, and what this uh, does is it allows the miner who is uh, uh, including this, transac this transaction into the block to, uh, to, take, the to take this uh, tip. And uh, this gives miners an incentive to include transactions with higher tip tips versus transactions with lower tips. So this way, um, if there's more transactions, the transactions, every miner is uh, ordering the transactions by tip and is including the transactions with the higher tips because they have financial uh, incentive to um, uh, get the tips. Now, uh, let's uh, look at uh, how the Coinbase uh, reward uh, evolved over time. So in 2009, it was Satoshi and his two friends. Uh, the Coinbase was 50 Bitcoin per 10 minutes. Um, 2012, will half to 25, 2016, 12.5. Uh, we had a halving uh, in 2020 last year, and now we are at uh, 6.25 uh, bit, Bitcoin uh, per, uh, per Coinbase. Uh, and uh, according to this graph, you see it's like a logarithmic, uh, it's, it's decaying very fast. So in, uh, in 2140, roughly, we're expecting that uh, the Coinbase will be zero because at some point uh, the algorithm says it becomes uh, zero. It's like so small that it becomes zero. And at that point, um, the expectation is that the transaction fees, those tips is going to be what the incentive is for miners to continue mining. Uh, let's look at the same uh, graph on another in another way. So for the first four years, the Coinbase, which is essentially the, rate, the emission rate, the rate in which new Bitcoin comes to existence uh, was uh, growing at, at this rate, which means that within the first uh, uh, four years, about 50% of the entire Bitcoin was already minted. And then an additional 25% was minted here, an additional 12.5% was minted here, and so on and so forth. That's why we say that it's uh, Bitcoin is a deflationary currency, which uh, uh, which means that there is a, a, um, a maximum amount of it, and it's kind of like uh, gold uh, or real estate. The 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 area of the earth is is set; it doesn't increase over time, and uh, therefore it is bound to uh, be deflating, meaning that it increases in value over over time. Whereas uh, fiat currencies, most uh, most of them, or if not all of them, are inflationary, which means that every year more of it gets uh, minted. Um, now let's look at the, the hash rate. So what is the hash rate? Um, so in the beginning, people were mining with uh, um, their computers, and uh, uh, they, could, they were able to produce uh, uh, one hash every so so many milliseconds. But uh, these days, uh, the customized hardware is used, uh, which is uh, initially it was uh, some uh, chips called FPGAs, and now very custom chips specifically for computing SATA 56 uh, uh, hashes in order to uh, increase the efficiency at which you can uh, uh, hash bitcoins. A and um, if you take 
everyone in the world, all the Bitcoin miners in the world, computers, and uh, some, uh, the amount of hashes per second each computer can do, um, then uh, this is what we call the, the hash rate. And um, uh, this is these days measured in exahashes per second, but no one knows what exahashes per second is. So the maximum number we are usually accustomed with is a tera hashes per second. Tera, it's like, uh, um, and uh, that's why this number here uh, is uh, 143 million tera hashes per second. So let, let's look at the history a little bit. So uh, in 2011. Uh, it was zero point, like that's somewhere here. It was 0 0.1 uh, terahashes per second. Then it went to 10, 20, 10,000, 300,000, 800,000, 2 million, 15 million, 42 million, 105 million last year, January. And uh, this January, uh, a few days ago, it was at uh, 143 uh, million, million terahashes per second. And, uh, and this is the difficulty. The difficulty is uh, following a similar graph as the, um, the hashes per second, because the more the difficulty, the more the hashes per second, the higher the difficulty needs to be adjusted to be. Uh, so it's a little bit of a delayed version of the, of the other graph. Okay, so I think that uh, I will stop uh, right here for today. And for the rest of the class, I will take questions. Uh, so that we can uh, talk about uh, these two important concepts uh, more next week. I think there will always be people who will be taking care of their private keys and they will not be losing their Bitcoin. But, uh, but anyways, I think what you are alluding to is that uh, uh, as long as uh, you keep divide the current, keep dividing the currency, then uh, the divisions of it uh, become uh, uh, more and more um, uh, valuable in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, also another answer is that um, uh, maybe not all uh, all cryptocurrencies, uh, e all is to cryptocurrencies is Bitcoin. Maybe there is a, a lot different properties that uh, people need, different utilities that people need to uh, implement uh, on top of cryptocurrencies. So I think the technology is here to stay. Uh, it's uh, mm -hmm. as we will see next class. It's the um, um, it's the first time in history that we are able to um, uh, not having the need to trust uh, some in organization uh, in order for us to uh, make specific uh, um, actions such as uh, transacting with uh, our funds or storing our funds. And it's also the first time in the history where you can have uh, self-sovereign identity in a way. So because mm -hmm. uh, we will talk about the private keys and public keys, um, if essentially the only person that can take Bitcoin out of your Bitcoin wallet is whoever has the private key, which is something like a password. Uh, and, uh, and you uh, can prove that you are who you are just by having the password. So in, in, the, in the past, in any other uh, historic event in, like, since the beginning of time, th th there is a, either I need, I'm living in a village a thousand years ago, that uh, and then everybody else in the villas know who I am and that's how I can establish that this uh, I can give you this piece of land and then everybody is a witness so your piece of land is yours or uh, in the recent years we have to use passports or credit cards or intermediaries so the intermediary would be the in the passport uh, example would be a, a country that issues the passport so then everybody trusts that the country gives uh, one password to one person and the password is legitimate or the bank institution which basically give, gave you the credit card or the debit or the bank account number and then people have to trust but with uh, with this uh, with this technology it's the first time that uh, that you can have this self-sovereign identity and i think there is a, a lot more innovation that will happen uh, because of this property we have a lot more things to invent uh, because of that uh, simple thing hmm. Thanks. The, there is a rule that is the longest uh, chain rule. So whichever one, uh, whichever, there could be forks of Bitcoin and um, 
uh, but uh, there is all, there's always one fork that is longer or has much higher difficulty than any other one. And that is the official uh, uh, Bitcoin uh, ledger that uh, people are following. That's one, uh, well, that's one answer to your uh, question. And, uh, and the, the other answer is that uh, uh, it is very possible that different peers include different set of transactions in their blocks. That's perfectly fine. But in the end of the day, one peer is going to find the, the nonce, it's going to essentially mine this block. Then whatever transactions this peer selected, these are the transactions that, uh, that will be recorded for, by everyone else. Because this person is going to say, here is my nonce, the nonce is going to come here, and is going to say, here is my Coinbase, Coinbase is going to come here, and then he's going to say, here's the list of transactions that I had. So um, the decision is made and we're all moving forward to the next uh, block. And there's multiple incentives why you want to, why you, you, why everyone moves to the next block, which we will see. What you're saying is possible and it's the case where Alice and Charlie find the nonce for their block, basically mine, mine their block at exactly, pretty much exactly the same time. That is possible. And at that moment, they're both of them are gonna start broadcasting the block. So what will end up, end up happening is just a network delay. Whoever's block, who, who, whomever's block reaches more people, more other nodes earlier than another, more other nodes will basically adopt it and they will start moving onto the next block. And when they receive, if Alice uh, arrived first and then, uh, the, these nodes are already mining the next block. If they receive Bob's uh, or Charlie's uh, block, they will say, mm, no, I'm actually already minting the next block. I'm mining the next block, I don't care. Uh, basically, they will recognize this as a fork and they will keep uh, doing what they are doing. Uh, if on another hand though, um, uh, th th let's say this is also possible if there was a network split if the entire internet of a specific country was down for an hour, then all the miners of that country would be basically mining by themselves and making decisions and creating blocks. And all the miners of the rest of the world would be creating blocks as well. So in this case, during that one hour, because the miners of that country are not that many, they are fewer than the rest of the world, let's say, uh, excluding a certain country, uh, then uh, uh, they will have produced not by one block every 10 minutes, maybe they have produced by one block every half an hour. So they will have uh, two blocks produced uh, in, uh, in that one hour. And the rest of the world will be producing, uh, maybe because they, they lost the country, they will not be producing one block every 10 minutes, they're one every 11 minutes. So they will have produced about five, five and a half blocks. So, so in the version, in the global version, um, the blockchain has five and a half, five, five more blocks. In the other version, it has two more blocks. So that blockchain is smaller. So everybody is just following the longest chain, the one that has the more, the more work, which we will see in the next uh, class exactly what uh, this means. So yes, forks can happen and uh, there is a way to, um, uh, to resolve them. Um, that, oh. That's why uh, we, we, uh, there is a, there's a property of uh, safety uh, and, uh, and liveness. So Bitcoin, uh, and there is a theoretical uh, guarantee, theoretical proof uh, in the in fault tolerant and distributed systems that you can't have really both. Um, and uh, Bitcoin is uh, a guaranteeing liveness, which means that no matter what, even if the whole, there's an atomic bomb, 90% of the world is, is gone. The remaining 10% is gonna keep producing blocks, but it, so liveness, it's gonna be live. It's not gonna block but it has the problem that it might not be safe. So in that situation we had where the country was disjoined by the rest of the world, they will have a different version and that version will vanish after uh, the whole network uh, reconnects. So uh, Bitcoin ha uh, doesn't guarantee safety, but it guarantees liveness. Other cryptocurrencies guarantee liveness, but not safety. For example, banks always guarantee safety versus liveness. So if there is a chance that uh, uh, your wire transfer might be lost, then the bank stops, says, sorry, we're down today. The server is not working. Uh, just come back later. We can't uh, send wires. That's the guaranteeing safety versus liveness, but uh, Bitcoin doesn't, uh, doesn't guarantee that. 
and um, I think uh, we are uh, ending in about five minutes. So uh, we have time for a few more questions. Keep uh, um, shooting. As a miner, what you do is you basically come and put your name here. You're a miner, Alice, and you put your name here and you press the, the mine button and you keep pressing the mine button for the rest of, uh, of your life. And, uh, and I guarantee you that you will never get a block because uh, it's so unlikely that you get a block. Um, but uh, what people do is they, they get a lot of computers together into a mining pool and that's how, and, the, and one of the people in the mining pool get the block and then, then they, split the, they split the coin base uh, uh, together. But, um, but this aside, um, that is one way, that's how people, that's what people uh, do. They, they are, they're putting their name in the coin base, they click mine and they hope that they will get the coin base. Um, now, the second way that they get Bitcoin is by, because some of these transactions contain tips. And uh, so they both, whoever mined the block, found the right nonce, is going to get the, point, the coin base and the tips. Um, and uh, that's the second way they do. Now, what happens is that uh, that Bitcoin goes into the account of uh, whomever, Alice in, the, in this case. And, and then what Alice can do is Alice can send, create transactions, send that Bitcoin to um, a, a, an exchange, a cryptocurrency exchange. So if you look at um, the, uh, the, the way how many Bitcoin belongs to what address, out there to what wallet, you will see that the, the largest ho holders of uh, Bitcoin and most cryptocurrencies are cryptocurrency exchanges. So, so what happens is that Alice here would open the, her mobile app. They will, she will go to Coinbase. She will say, I wanna transfer my Bitcoin from, uh, from the blockchain to, to, my, to my app. And then the app will say, oh, okay, great. Please send it to this address. And then Alice is going to go to her favorite uh, wallet, which is going to produce basically a transaction like this. And uh, she will say, okay, I want to send uh, uh, this many Bitcoin that I have to the, to the cryptocurrency exchanges wallet address that they specifically gave me and, and make the transaction. They, they submit the transaction on the network. Potentially they include a fee or a transaction uh, tip and after several minutes, maybe 10 minutes or 20 minutes or whenever the transaction is included in, the, in, the, in a block, then the transaction happened. So when it happened, then they go back to the mobile app that has the, or the website that uh, of their favorite cryptocurrency, favorite cryptocurrency exchange. And, uh, and then after a while, there is some software that is running on the, on the exchange that is validating that this uh, transaction actually arrived. And then it uh, increases the balance of the Bitcoin for that person on the balance of the crypto exchange. Now, when most exchanges, unless they are decentralized exchanges, which is a different kind of uh, uh, thing, but most, uh, most major uh, popular well-known exchanges, they are not uh, decentralized at all, meaning that uh, they are the same concept as any bank. So you trust them with your funds. So you don't have any private keys. You don't have any of these things that we'll talk about, any of the guarantees that we talk, we'll talk about next uh, class. So you just trust them with their funds. Their funds, uh, uh, your funds, your Bitcoin corresponds to a database record in the transaction. And then you can uh, uh, order transactions in the same way you would order transactions in a, in a stock exchange. It's like just normal, plain, old uh, um, server stuff. Uh, it's nothing, nothing to do with... Uh, with crypto. Yeah, Bitcoin has a, a, a very specific uh, um, scripting language that you can apply. So you can do very simple things such as uh, um, um, multi-sig wallets and things like that. Um, but uh, what the um, breakthrough of well, let's say the innovation of uh, ethereum was is that uh, ethereum's programming language is uh, completely generic so you can uh, do almost every program that you can imagine you can't do input output stuff 
but you can do any program that you can imagine. Uh, having said this, uh, uh, the whole Ethereum uh, computer is comparable to an extremely slow computer from the 70s. And the reason it's not like uh, the reason why this is uh, the case is by choice, uh, because uh, uh, it, the, that computation is being replicated across every single node. So you don't want the we don't want it to be running machine learning algorithms. You want it to basically make sure this uh, smart contract when you send it funds, it responds this. Like you can create an escrow smart contract, or you can create your unit swap, or what you want to uh, create on it. But uh, you can create. Uh, um, a complex uh, algorithm. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. Okay, cool. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. We'll be on Slack and uh, we, I'll see you again uh, next uh, class.